Okay, ready to go. Hello. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Gloria Chuku, Chair of Africana Studies Department. I am happy to welcome you to the 43rd Annual WEB Dubai's Lecture. The longest running academic uh, lecture series on campus. This le uh, lecture has benefited uh, the, uh, from the generosity of the following co-sponsors. The Departments of American Studies, Sociology, Anthropology and Public Health, the Division of Professional Studies, the Dresser Center for the Humanities, the Office of the Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, the Shriver Center, and the Social Science Forum. Before we proceed, I have few announcements to make. I want to remind Africana Studies majors and minors that the deadline for the Ele Chukunjaka Scholarship and Creative Research Award is on November 30th. Please visit the Africana Studies website for more information. Just uh, click on the student resources. The second announcement I have to make is in connection with the 2022 Second International Model African Union, we have started recruiting for the summit in Washington, D.C. The summit is on February 23rd through 27th. The International Model African Union is a simulation of the African Union Commission. If you are interested in diplomacy, and learning about modern Africa. This is a great opportunity for you. Training begins in late December through the winter session and the summit runs up the program in February. If you are interested, please send me an email at chuku at umbc.edu. For this evening lecture, written captioning will be provided as already posted um, in the chat. Please uh, read the chat for how to get or how to turn on the captioning. I am really, really honored to introduce our speaker for today's lecture. The speaker is Dr. Joseph B. Richardson, Jr., who is um, the Joel and Kim Feller Professor of African American Studies and Medical Anthropology at the University of Maryland College Park. He is currently the Acting Chair of the Department of African Studies and holds a joint appointment in the Department of Anthropology. Dr. Richardson holds a secondary appointment as professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health Division of Preventive Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He is the research director for the Center for Injury Prevention and Policy Violence Intervention Program at the University of Maryland Adams College Shock Trauma Center where his research team investigates gun violence, firearm-related injury, trauma, and the effectiveness of a University of Maryland Medical Systems hospital-based violence prevention programs. Dr. Richardson's research focuses on the following key areas. Causes and collateral consequences of gun violence and trauma, structural and interpersonal violence, incarceration and community supervision as social determinants of health, violence prevention and intervention programming and policy, and parenting strategies 
for low income black boys. Dr. Richardson is the co-founder and founding director of the Capital Region Violence Intervention Program, a hospital-based violence intervention program at the University of Maryland Prince George's Hospital Center, which he directed from 2017 through 2019. He is the executive director of the Transformative Research and Applied Violence Intervention Lab, a multidisciplinary gun violence research lab in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the University of Maryland, and also the executive director of Life After Gunshot, digital storytelling discourses, which explore intersection of the healthcare and criminal justice systems among young black male survivors of violent firearm injury in the District of Columbia and Prince George's County, Maryland. Dr. Richardson, over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you to everyone that has uh, participated and assisted with getting me to this point. Uh, I really appreciate all of your, all of your help and, and, and support. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Joseph Richardson, uh, as mentioned, and hopefully tonight I'll be able to walk you through um, my research on gun violence and, and how that research is translated into interventions and some of the challenges um, concerning where we are today in the, in, the, in the US in terms of the gun violence epidemic that we're experiencing. And so again, I'd just like to thank University of Maryland, Baltimore County for inviting me, particularly the Department of Africana Studies and, and I'll jump into it. So I couldn't start this presentation without uh, a, a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois. And as, as an African-American studies scholar and, and Du Bois serving as, as one of um, the models of, of, of black excellence in, in black scholarship, I, I thought that this quote was apropos for this presentation. A system cannot fail those who it was never meant to protect. And uh, throughout this conversation, I'll walk you through why Du Bois' words resonate um, with the presentation that I'm making in terms of structural and interpersonal violence among young black men. So in 2020 and in 2021, America is now experiencing an epidemic within a pandemic uh, while we are experiencing COVID, we have a gun violence epidemic, which is known as America's other epidemic. And this is a, a picture taken from a shooting scene in Baltimore. And, and what I've really found to be, you know, um, often disturbing is you see the police officer with the marking off of the shell casings picking up a hat but everyone in the background seems to be carrying on their, their day like as in normal life is, as this, this is just a normal occurrence. And that's part of the, the challenge in um, working in this space of gun violence and working with communities that are traumatized, that scenes like this often become very desensitized to the people who are living in those environments and how that impacts their, their psyche. And so, for those who don't know, I just want to put some of these things in context as we move further into the, this conversation. But for those of you who didn't know, black people in Maryland are 17 times more likely than white people to die from gun violence. And I'm going to pivot between Maryland and DC because I, I think it's important for me to not only talk about the District of Columbia, but also to speak on gun violence in the context of the state of Maryland as well. In terms of um, gun violence in DC, DC has the second highest rate of gun violence and, and a second highest rate of gun homicides and gun assaults in this country. And here are the numbers to reflect the difference between 
gun violence in 2020 and gun violence in 2021. And this was as of today, you can see that DC is at 192 homicides. Last year uh, in 2020, DC at the end of December, the homicide rate was, uh, the total for homicides was 198. So you can clearly see as of November the 10th, we will be exceeding the uh, homicide rate set last year. And between last year at this time and this year, the difference is 12% with 20 additional lives that were lost. And you can also see in other categories that uh, violence is going up in other categories as well. And some of these things based on the ecosystem of gun violence are all interrelated. And I just wanna to mention too, because I think it would be important just to put this in context of the numbers in terms of gun violence and what we're experiencing. In 2019, there were 15,448 deaths via uh, gun violence in America. By 2020, that number had reached 19,411. So there were 4,000 more uh, incidents of, of gun-related homicides in this country between one year and the next. And if you compare injuries as well, in 2019, there were 30,186 uh, gun-related gun injuries compared to 39,492 firearm-related injuries in 2020. So as you can see, there's been a significant increase. This is just in, uh, was, was a snapshot of the homicides um, in Baltimore, and this was taken from um, the Baltimore Sun, which I uh, recorded today. And as you can see, there are multiple dots around the city of Baltimore. Many of them are concentrated on the west side, and we'll talk a little bit more about structural violence and how structural violence is tied into the number of these dots. But as you can see, uh, again, we're at 292 homicides as of November the 10th. And last year, Baltimore, I believe, experienced 330 homicides. So we're well on the way to probably exceeding the number of homicides um, suffered in Baltimore in 2020. And so my job as a researcher and uh, particularly a translational researcher who translates my research from, uh, from data into interventions is to explain well, what's underneath those red dots? Because people can often look at these uh, geographic information maps and, and look at them as dots. And we use that in order to frame our crime reduction strategies and where crime is taking place. But we often forget about the humanity of those, li of those lives that are associated with those dots and all the families and friends that are, are, cons are collateral uh, damage in terms of the deaths uh, that are associated, that, that represent those dots in these maps that I've just shown. So I try to bridge my work between the academy and young black men who are injured. And as um, was mentioned, I utilize the two busiest trauma centers in the state of Maryland as my research labs and use those trauma centers in order to inform innovative interventions. And one of those interve interventions was a hospital-based violence intervention program that I co-founded at the University of Maryland, uh, Prince George's Hospital Center, which is now known as Capital Region Health. But this is a, a picture taken from the Terps Magazine and focused on some of my work in terms of how I try to translate my research into interventions by connecting with young black men who have been violently injured by firearm. And why this is so important to me, first, um, gun violence is the leading cause of death and disability among black men between the ages of 16 and 44. And it has been consistently the leading cause of death among that population for decades. And here is a, a very startling and sobering statistic. And unfortunately, uh, many of the statistics that I'll present throughout this presentation are very sobering, but I, I think the reality of what we're experiencing in this country, particularly among black Americans, we must confront this head on. And so almost 60% of all gun homicide victims are black men, despite black men comprising only 7% of the US population. One of the ways that I try to convey the stories of young men who have been injured as well as their families, um, friends, 
uh, romantic partners and wives is through digital storytelling. And so at, at one point in my career, I did a lot of ethnographic work where I, I conducted interviews and focus groups. And I often wanted people to see the body language of the young men that I was interviewing. And so while I was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago prior to coming to uh, the University of Maryland, I decided to take some documentary filmmaking classes and, uh, and self-taught myself how to, to shoot a film. And out of that uh, last year, um, we ended up and we filmed 10 young black men who had been violently injured and treated at University of Maryland Prince George's Hospital Center. And we use those stories to, to discuss and illuminate the ways that they experienced trauma, trauma that was associated with their with their violent injury, but also the trauma associated with living in a community where there are few and limited resources and there are high levels of structural and interpersonal violence. And so we look at violence as not post-traumatic stress, but as a continuum of traumatic symptoms that, and trauma that occur across the lifespan and the life course. And so uh, um, we were very fortunate that uh, our documentary film, which aired on uh, March 31st, has gained national attention, and you you can access it on um, on at www.lifeafterthegunshot.com. And these are uh, in the middle is Che Bullock, who is the, was the violence intervention specialist at my hospital, and also happened to be a young man that I met at bedside when I was conducting my first study on violent injury at Prince George's Hospital. And ultimately our relationship from that study translated into him becoming a member of, of my staff and a key member in connecting to young men, such as the young man that's on the left, whose name is Slim, who's also a focal uh, character in the documentary. And, and he was injured and hospitalized for injury on three separate occasions. He was shot on two separate occasions and also stabbed once. And, and we're proud to say that since we've engaged with young men like Slim, we've been able to reduce their level of trauma recidivism. And so the film investigates the ways that they express trauma, their trauma that they feel not only in their bodies, but also psychologically and emotionally, and the ways that that trauma also impacts their families and caregivers. So this is a clip from the documentary, and I, I'm, I'm happy to say that we were recently uh, submitted our documentary to the Indie Fest Film Festival, and last week we were notified that we were award winners um, in our first award for this documentary. So I'm very proud of that. But this is a clip from one of the young men in in the documentary film, and I, his name is Tip, and he discusses the trauma that he experienced after being violently injured. I pull up the end of the parking lot, make a sprint 56 times. He thought it was fireworks. It wasn't. He started handing the shade off the wall, and it was real. I didn't know I was shot until I got around the corner. I felt a cramp. And my hand got real hot because of the blood. Looked down, I got shot. I passed out about two, three times. Ambulance came to the hospital. Got out the next day. Wartime. I'd say for the guys that we work with, um, hypervigilance is the main symptom. And hypervigilance is the feeling of I'm not safe. I just moved into my own little spot. I hear little noises. I'd be thinking it's something else, a whole ball game. I'm way out my By the time I get halfway through the hallway, I'm like, man, lay your ass back down. Like real life, man. Getting used to it, man. I gotta get, get back used to being comfortable. That's what it is. I was comfortable in the streets. Got shot. Now I gotta get comfortable and just chilling. You know what I'm saying? Working, doing what I gotta do. Hypervigilance is under hyper arousal, which means that the nervous system is stuck in fight mode. So the person is always amped up. They're argumentative. They're um, easily triggered. Anything that someone says to them, they go from, you know, 
having a moment of calm to a moment of intense anger and rage. What other ways did it, did it change you? Attitude, definitely. My eating habits, my breathing, my anxiety. Mainly anger, though. Were you more angry after that? Still were. So what we find among many of the young men that we work with who have been injured are suffering from symptoms of traumatic stress and anger happens to be one of those symptoms. And many researchers and scholars have speculated and theorized that one of the reasons why we're seeing such an increase in gun violence in this country is associated with incidents where people get into an argument and two people don't lack the coping mechanisms to to rationally solve it and their anger, they can move from zero to 100 in a matter of seconds. And if you are can't control your anger and you also have a firearm, it's more likely than someone will be injured. And so what we try to do in, the, in our intervention work is to address through our psychotherapist, Edward McCurdy, and I'll talk about a little bit more about him later, but what we try to do through cognitive behavioral therapy is to really dig deep into those symptoms of traumatic stress, such as hypervigilance, where people feel unsafe. They're often, they often mistrust people who are around them. And that also leads to many young men carrying a firearm defensively. But what we have to also think about is when does defensively carrying a firearm shift over to offensively carrying one because your symptoms of traumatic stress have gone, gone undiagnosed and untreated. And so one of the um, key issues that I really want to touch upon in this, in this presentation is not just focusing on gun violence, but also the social determinants of health for black men who live in DC. And in terms of structural violence, one of the key measures of structural violence is life expectancy. And here, this is an article from the Washington Post, which found that uh, black men in DC are expected to die 17 years earlier than white men. And there are many reasons why that occurs, and they're often tied to the social determinants of health. And so these are some of the social determinants of health for young black men in DC. Uh, some of them that may stand out to many of you, for example, access to medical care. So for in, in Ward 7 and 8, which are east of the river in Washington, D.C., and are predominantly black and poor, they suffer from medical deserts. They actually have no level 1 or level 2 trauma center, which is why at the University of Maryland Prince George's Hospital Center, where we were initially located in Chevrolet, Maryland, which is on the border of Washington, D.C., uh, at least 40% of our gunshot wounds were from Ward 7 and 8. Um, in terms of, of food deserts, uh, when you look at one of the social determinants of health is food and environment. Uh, same thing in Ward 7 and 8. Uh, within the last two year, 10 years, they actually received their first uh, supermarket. So prior to that, there were no supermarkets, at least chain supermarkets, in, uh, in Ward 7 and 8 for a significant population of people. And so these are all things which can determine your level of life expectancy. And your zip code is often predictive of how long you will live. And race is often tied to your life expectancy and health out outcomes and race and place. So I want you to look at these pictures and and I want you to think about what they all have in common. And the one thing for me of what they all have in common are their different expressions of violence. And so the young man who is on the top right lifting up his shirt is a survivor of a gunshot wound. So he's he is a model or proto or he is a model or example of what we typically understand as violence. Someone has ended up shot or stabbed or beaten real badly, and that's how we tr traditionally frame violence. But these other pictures are also forms of violence. 
And so here we have on the far left, uh, an enslaved African, and as you can see, the scars on his back from, from being um, abused by, uh, by his slave owner. To the right of that, we have a chain gang, um, which was replaced slavery after slavery was formally abolished in the Constitution, but still existed in the 13th Amendment. And then we have to the right of that, if you speed up to the 21st century, here we have primarily young black and brown men who are under uh, the criminal justice system. And then if you at the bottom, we have the Flint water crisis, and then we have Hurricane Katrina. These are all forms of violence, but I would like to say that absent the, uh, the enslaved African and the young black man lifting up his shirt, all of these are, are, are forms of structural violence. So we have, we have institutional violence and then we have interpersonal violence. And I want us to really think hard about the ways that we frame and think about violence because violence is not limited and bound by a fist, a stick or knife or a gun. These are also forms of violence because they cause harm to specific groups. And we know that the harm caused is preventable. And so I will talk, use structural violence as a theoretical framework throughout this conversation. And the pioneer of that work, uh, Gautong, Johan Gautong, stated that violence where social institutions uh, cause harm, preventing people from meeting their basic needs. And so when we have life expectancy differentials and wealth differentials that lead to shorter life expectancy in Washington, D.C., there are often forms of structural violence, and I'll show you why. So here, you have the difference in life expectancy in Woodley Park and St. Elizabeth's. Woodley Park is primarily a middle-class, affluent, white neighborhood in Northwest D.C., while St. Elizabeth's is a predominantly poor black community east of the river. And as you can see here, between Woodley Park, the life expectancy is 89.4 years, and in St. Elizabeth's is 68.4. So if you were merely to take a ride on one on the DC Metro on a 15-minute ride between Woodley Park and, and St. Elizabeth, you would lose roughly 21 years of your life. And that's a form of structural violence. And so here is also uh, indicative of the way that income is, is correlated to life expectancy. And so as we see in the dark blue with the smaller dots, these are neighborhoods that are predominantly poor and black. And as we move further to the Northwest sector of Washington, DC, we see that the income increases and it also, this section of the city also becomes whiter. So you can see the difference between how segregation, racial segregation plays out and how that plays out in terms of income and then the impact that has on life expectancy. So I mentioned in the outset of this conversation that we are, the gun violence epidemic is occurring within a pandemic and we call that a syndemic. So in DC, uh, the black COVID fatality rate is six times higher than the white COVID fatality rate. And I have to just say, you know, within the last two weeks, um, I've heard five stories of, of black people that live in the DC metropolitan area that have died from COVID who, who were not vaccinated. And, and unfortunately in one situation, a mother and a son died a week apart from each other. And so in the, in the DC Metro, these COVID fatality rates are very real. And I'm sure many of us know people who have been infected and possibly have died from COVID. And so just in terms of housing, and we can see the concentration of single family units that again are in the Northwest sector of DC. And as we move east of the river, we find far more apartment complexes uh, and, and far more uh, Section 8 housing and public housing east of the river. 
right? And this is often also we're finding a higher concentration of that occurring as a result of gentrification in the district, where the district happens to be the fastest uh, and rapidly gentrifying city in the United States. So a great deal of displacement is occurring in the district as well. Again, in terms of social determinants of health, the in the Burgundy, these are all neighborhoods that are marked by food deserts. And as I, I mentioned, east of the river, there were uh, up until the last within the last five to ten years, there were no supermarkets east of the river. And as we see, as you move further into Northwest DC, you find far more grocery stores. And you also found more walk shed places where people are closer and, to, and more accessible to transportation. So how does this play out in the school system? Well, we also see disparities in terms of the differences in, in students who are expelled, which pushes more black children in the school to prison pipeline. And here we see that in the district, uh, black students are 15 times more likely to be suspended as white students. We also see that black students represent 31% of all school related arrests. And that black children are 10 times more likely to be killed from gun violence um, than, than white children. And gun violence is the leading cause of death, not only for young people between the ages of 16 to 44, but also for black children as well. And I'm quite sure if this disease was infecting any other racial or ethnic group, we would have considered it a public health crisis a, a much a while ago, and we would have addressed it with adequate resources. So how does this all play out in terms of net wealth? Well, here we see how all of these things in terms of uh, the intergenerational transference of wealth, the concentration of poverty of households east of the river, and how that impacts ultimately impacts uh, the differentials between black and white wealth. And what uh, was found in between 2013 and 2014 is that the average white household in DC has a net wealth of 284,000 compared to a, a black household, which has a net worth of $3,500. And so these are also, um, these are charts which reflect the increase in the concentration of poverty among um, black Washingtonians over the past 45 years. And as you can see, the high poverty has increased from 1970 to 2015. And also um, uh, poverty has actually decreased among black Washingtonians between 1970 and 2015, while high poverty has increased. This statistic uh, graph reflects the number of black people who are disproportionately stopped by the police. And we cannot talk about gun violence without discussing the intersection of the healthcare and criminal justice system. And so here, these, this graph reflects that on average, um, 45, Black people are stopped and frisked every day in the district compared to just two. Which is quite odd. Uh, black and white Washingtonians are, are relatively uh, represent the, the percentage wise, the same level of uh, share the same numbers in terms of population. Black Washingtonians are roughly 46% of the, of the DC population. And I think whites are around relatively the same, but we clearly we see the disp disproportionate number of black Washingtonians who are stopped every day and searched by uh, the police. I would also like to add that DC is one of the most hyper surveilled cities in the United States, and it has well over 30 law enforcement agencies within the District of Columbia. And so this is uh, data from the DC Metropolitan Police Department on their stop data, and this, these are the report the number of people who are stopped in the district and for what reasons. And I think that you'll find this to be quite interesting, but also very sobering. So these are all the non-ticket stops in the district. And as I mentioned, 
uh, black Washingtonians represent 46% of the population. And I think it's much lower now based on the most recent census, maybe down to 42. But as you can see, these are all the districts in DC, police districts. So 1D, 2D, 3D, there are seven police districts. And as you can see oh, uh, to the far right, black Washingtonians represent 86%, almost nine out of 10 of all non-ticket stops by the police. So literally, almost everyone that's stopped in the district by the Metropolitan Police Department, they're black. And these are the reasons why they're stopped, right? So let's just take individual actions. That's, that's totally subjective and left to the discretion of a police officer to determine why they would stop someone for a reason that they deem to be probable cause, right? That could be based on an officer's, any officer's bias interpretation for why they should stop someone, which leads to this systematic racism in terms of the disproportionate number of black Washingtonians who are stopped. And so you would think um, because black Washingtonians prior to the legalization of marijuana and they were being stopped disproportionately for um, and, and charged with marijuana possession, that the legalization of marijuana would change that. But in fact, it did not. In DC, again, similar to the 86% of black Washingtonians who are stopped by the police, 90% of everyone, of all the individuals that are arrested for marijuana in the district are black. And this translates into what? the hyper-policing, hyper-surveillance, and arrest rates, high arrest rates of Black Washingtonians results in the District of Columbia having one of the highest uh, incarceration rates in the world, right? So you can see the District of Columbia compared to the incarceration rate in the United States, it's almost double. And this is in the nation's capital. And so if we use the nation's capital as a barometer for where uh, the rest of black America is experiencing the impact of incarceration, structural violence, and interpersonal violence, DC serves as the litmus test for that. So this was a very interesting study uh, done by my uh, colleague, uh, Becky Pettit, who, who passed recently, but uh, prior to her passing, she she conducted a study and it was uh, she titled the study and her book marked and it was the impact of a felony on the labor market opportunities for black and white men and what she did was she sent out two testers both uh, black and white male with the same resume and then on one resume she would include that the person had a felony and on the other resume, she would include that they did not, but the resumes were, were the same and they would go out to employers for, in, for interviews or call them and so, or submitting, the, submitting their application. And what she found, ironically, is that, oh, not even ironically and not necessarily surprisingly, but that white men with a record had more of a likelihood than get, to get a call back from a job than a black applicant with no record at all. And as you can see, 17% of white men who had a record were more likely to get a call back than the 14% of black men with no record at all. And so what Dr. Uh, Pedro surmised was, is that have, being black is equivalent to having a felony. And I just want to put that in context because all of these factors lead to gun violence. This is also, and I'm pivoting a little bit, but I'm a native of Philadelphia, so I thought that this was important to actually present this slide. You can see in the ways that the number of shooting victims by zip code actually correspond with the percentage of black men who were not employed. And if we look at incarceration rates and, and the ways that felony disenfranchisement leads to black men not being able to penetrate the legal labor market, we can also see why the, there's a correlation between high unemployment rates and being a shooting victim. 
And so for those who don't, uh, who, who may not understand the implications of having a felony, if you have a drug felony in the United States, you're unable to access student loans, you're unable to live in public housing, you're not able to live with someone that, who lives in public housing, and in many ways it impacts your ability to get employment and licensing. And what we found uh, through the Judge Alexander Williams Center at the University of Maryland, they conducted a study on the collateral consequences of a felony. And what they found in the state of Maryland that there were 1,100 collateral consequences associated with having a felony. 1,100. And so a study that I conducted at the University of Maryland uh, Shock Trauma Center on risk factors for recurrent violent injury and what I mean by recurrent what would bring young black men back to the hospital for a similar penetrative injury? Currently, the, the trauma recidivism rate is anywhere between 5 and 65%. And so let me put that into context. If we were on a trauma floor and there were 10 patients and they all suffered from a gunshot wound, when the trauma recidivism rate is 65%, that means at least 6 out of the 10 this is their second, third, fourth, or maybe fifth time being hospitalized for a violent injury. And some people would wonder, well, that just seems unfathomable why someone would continue to come back to the hospital for a violent injury. What we found is, is a history of incarceration was the number one risk factor for bringing someone back to the hospital, which ties in directly to the collateral consequences of having a felony and even the trauma that may be associated with being with incarceration as well. And so if you're unable to get a job and you've been incarcerated and have a felony conviction, the co collateral consequences of felony disenfranchisement may push you back into the illegal economy, which would also force you into high risk behaviors such as carrying a gun. And so when we, we think about the implications of incarceration and gun violence, we we have to we have to consider though the ways that the criminal justice system impacts young men who come into the healthcare system. And so just to put uh, some numbers on um, the gun violence epidemic in in Washington D.C. and these are numbers from 2020. Last year there were 198 homicides, as I, I mentioned in the outset, and almost a thousand people were shot in Washington D.C. And that 922 individuals, they get spread out among the trauma units that serve the DC metropolitan area. And they're uh, approximately four uh, level one trauma centers. Sorry about that. What I do want you to pay attention to, because I will talk about this a little bit more, as we can see the disproportionate number of homicide victims who are black, but I also want you to look at the statistics on the number of women who are victims of homicide. And as we can see between 2019 and 2020, the number of women who have been victims of homicide has increased 141%, jumping from 12 to 29%. And I'll discuss that a little bit later on the, on the future implications of, of my research. And these are all the, the concentration of where shootings occur. And if you have paid attention to the social determinants of health and all the maps that I've presented thus far, you can see that the, the concentration of shootings in Washington, D.C. mimic and parallel where all the concentration of other chronic disease and other social determinants of health are happening. And so if we were to overlay the other maps on top of this map, we would find that the shootings are concentrated in the same places where we find concentrations of poverty, food deserts, um, uh, inadequate access to health care, et cetera. So the, what does it cost our country every year? It's, it costs our country $280 billion um, in, in costs for gun violence in our country uh, during the COVID epidemic. And there's been a lot of discussion around, should we defund the police, right? And, and shift the money that we're using for the police 
into more public health interventions. And so what we found here is these are the these are the um, budgets for the District of Columbia for 2020 and 2021. And you can see that there was in local funds, there was um, 1,550 million approved, and then it was revised to 547 million. And then it was shipped over to 2021. The mayor proposed 533 million, and it was, she was, uh, the mayor was approved for 523 million. And this is uh, the operating budget for the police department. So let's see what how much money was spent on uh, a public health approach to reduce violence. 15 million. Not even 10% of the police department's budget was shifted over to a public health approach. And that's concerning and troubling. Um, one of the public health approaches are violence interrupter programs, also known as cure violence. And the, the pink and blue shaded areas represent where these programs are situated. And these programs use violence interrupters, typically people who are once engaged in violence um, in their communities and have changed their life around to serve as credible messengers to diffuse conflict and retaliation. And so what you find is a mixed bag of shootings, which represent the black dots, which are occurring in, in, in some of the sites where violence interruption services are located. But you also find that there are many shootings that are outside of those areas as well. So what many of uh, people within scholars and practitioners within this space have advocated for is that we need to increase that $15 million. So we're covering entire areas. So we're not just limiting our violence interruption and, and prevention services to one small slice of a neighborhood, but actually blanketing the neighborhood with violence intervention and prevention services. And again, this is a similar map. DC. And so why are, are we losing the war on gun violence based on everything I, I've mentioned? And then how can we change that narrative? So this is a, a, a chapter that I'd written in the in uh, the this book that I uh, recently had shown the cover, and it was and it was based on my experiences over a two year period. My experiences directing a hospital violence intervention program, and what hospital violence intervention programs do, and there are forty around the country, and they're part, members of the Healing Alliance Violence uh, Initiative. Um, what we do is provide psychosocial services to people who come into the trauma unit who have been violently injured. And so we do that in the form of providing cognitive behavioral therapy. And as you saw, Edward McCurdy, uh, the black therapist in my clip was our psychotherapist who provided cognitive behavioral therapy to many of the young men who were um, treated at our hospital. And then Che Bullock, who was a violence intervention specialist also, um, co-facilitated those cognitive behavioral therapy um, sessions with our young men. And we were quite successful in getting young men who typically would not engage in therapy to, to address their trauma. They were coming literally every week. And so this is Dr. Cornell Cooper, the person that introduced me to hospital violence intervention programs. And he was, he was one of the pioneers of HVIPs, and he started the first uh, hospital violence intervention program at the Shock Trauma Center in Baltimore. And Dr. Cooper serves as my served as my mentor, showing me the ropes of how to start a program, and still serves as my mentor uh, to this day. So this is yours truly. Um, this was uh, a photo shoot, uh, which was in Turp Magazine. I, I thought I looked pretty cool right there, uh, adding the sneakers into my photo shoot, um, but this was a photo shoot based on the work that I've been doing um, following in Dr. Cooper's uh, footsteps in developing a hospital violence intervention program. And so one of the, one of the challenges with doing this work, uh, how do you translate research on black men who have been violently injured into an intervention? And so in tw between 2013 and 2015, 15, 
I uh, led a research study with 25 young men who had been injured, who were uh, treated at Prince George's Hospital Center with my um, postdoctoral fellow, Chris St. Bill. And we decided to write a paper of all the challenges we experienced in that in, in setting. And one of our primary challenges was young men thinking that we were the police. And so we often ran into those challenges because uh, when someone is injured within 24 hours, the police are interrogating them at bedside. And what we have found in not only in our work, but across the field is that many police officers and law enforcement officers often violate the uh, patient rights of, of violently injured patients by interrogating them in the room when they're heavily sedated. They often blame the victim. I've been present in a room where a 15 year old was a survivor of a violent injury and should have been had his parent or guardian present and was and was interrogated by the police by two police officers, even though he was 15 years old without the presence of a parent or guardian, which uh, according to hospital policy, if it's within the pol policy of a hospital is illegal. We've also found that police will confiscate through third parties because they're not able to do it directly will confiscate phones will confiscate someone's license and even their clothes. And they often ask the nurses to hand over that property because the police aren't able to do it um, directly. So they use third parties in order to confiscate um, those items. And what we're trying to do now within the clinical space is educate medical staff on how they should navigate dealing with the police because we've been in very confrontational situations often where the police they were interrogating someone who was recently brought in, shot multiple times, he's about to be operated on a trauma. He's in the trauma bay. They're cutting his, this person's clothes off and the police are interrogating him about who shot them. Right? So there are a lot of issues that uh, we experience in terms of some of the methodological challenges of the lack of trust that young men have of the police for warranted reasons and assuming because we're following behind the police and coming into the room as researchers that we're law enforcement as well. This is an article from the Huffington Post uh, written by uh, our colleague Nick Wing and the article focused on how hospital and violence interventions programs are doing what politicians have been unable to do and that's to reduce uh, the levels of gun violence among high risk individuals. And so in our program, as I mentioned, uh, we're the Capital Region Violence Intervention Program. We're cap called CAPVIT for short. We provided trauma-informed care, cognitive behavioral therapy, employment and educational assistance, housing assistance, which I asterisked because it was so difficult for us to relocate people who were injured because we are situated in the and right outside of the District of Columbia. Many of our patient population are residents of the district and with the housing cost and the, and the limited supply within the district it's often difficult to find uh, housing um, to, to uh, send many of our patients to secure and safe spaces. And so these are, this is our catchment area, uh, Ward 7 and 8 and then Prince George's County is bounded by I-95 and the areas in green are called uh, known as transforming neighborhoods initiatives. And those are the catchment areas where we would typically get a significant number of our patients from Prince George's County, which also, by the way, has exceeded uh, 100 homicides this year. And I don't believe that has happened in, in, in well over 10 years. So this is our trauma registry leading up to from 2017 to 2020. And if you just look at the next to the year column, you can see the GSWs have increased from 230 to 333, which, which also reflects the increase in the epidemic of gun violence that we're experiencing. So we can use health records as well to, to record the number of people who are coming in shot and how we can use that to, to explain that gun violence, in addition to police reports, is increasing by using medical health records. So the success of our program was we had 116 program participants and out of the 116, we had one person come back to the hospital for a violent injury 
in a matter of two years. And if you do the math, that's less than 1% of a trauma recidivism rate. Now, I remind you, I said the trauma recidivism rate right now, it's, it, at that point, it was 60%. It's up to 65%. But our trauma recidivism rate before we started our program was 32%. So that meant every three out of 10 gunshot wound victims had been to our hospital or another hospital before for a similar injury. We were able to reduce that to less than 1%. Five minutes. Okay. So let me just walk through these things. We uh, I, I mentioned Che as a credible messenger, and this is him at bedside. And this is Che with another one of our. That was uh, Tip, who was in the in the clip, who then became uh, a member of uh, uh, went on to become a member of our hospital staff. Uh, we often use Uber Health as a way to transport our young men safely from their homes and in, into the hospital to get services. And you, I can talk about that a little bit later. One, and one of the things I wanna also emphasize is we focused on enrolling young men into the Affordable Care Act because what we were finding is that um, over 70% of all the young men who came into our trauma unit were not insured and they were leaving uninsured. and so. We also uh, created uh, a mechanism for young men to be insured before they were discharged. And then this is focuses on traumatic stress. And that was shown in the clip. This was uh, this is slim and this was taken from um, our every town community violence and trauma report that uh, I had written this article and he says, the next generation is in a cycle right now. The kids that is being born in my neighborhood, they're growing up to the beast that we started. They're traumatized right now. They don't know it though. I was once them, I was him, I was her. I know what they're about to go through. And so just in terms of, we've no, we know that police shootings should also be included in gun violence and uh, Black Americans are three times more likely than white Americans to be killed by gun violence. And I had written an article called Who Shot You, which essentially said that the hospitals should record and investigate whether the uh, patients who are coming into the ED have been brutalized or shot by the police. And the reason why that's so necessary is because only three to 4% of all law enforcement agencies and there are 18,000 in the United States, they are not required by the federal government to report police involved shootings to the FBI. And so we need to uh, have another mechanism for, for the medical system to record police involved shootings. You can find this uh, app, it's M MXMLK. And what we were also uh, in, in finding in our work in the trauma center is that many people who were involved in uh, Black Lives Matter protests were being injured by the police, but the, the medical staff were miscoding or not coding their injuries as injuries by law enforcement, which they can do on the ICD-10. And so what we decided to do is create an app and if you've been injured by the police, you can document that on this app if you've been injured by the police in a protest. And I'll skip that. This is my lab. If anyone wants to uh, look at our, our work on, on my lab. And uh, our current studies, we're doing a study on uh, black men's health and we're looking at complex trauma among black men. And we also have currently our pilot piloting um, a mental health treatment module with young men who have been shot. And it's a, it's a culturally competent model. We do it virtually on Tuesday nights uh, with young men who have been injured in Baltimore. And I just wanted this, if I don't say anything, my current study now is focusing on the increase in the number of black women who have been shot and have, and have, have survived. And what we're seeing in Baltimore are many more young men coming into the trauma unit that are survivors of violent injury that's not DV or IPV related, but uh, community-based violence. And so here we see this, this number, which is, which is quite uh, sobering that at least four black women and girls were murdered per day last year in 2020. And so ultimately, as I move to close, we need to think about how we're going to fund 
programs that provide violence prevention and intervention um, in the state of Maryland and across the country. And one of the reasons why this is so important, if, if many of you may not know, um, Governor Hogan in 2020 vetoed the Violence Intervention and Prevention Fund, which was roughly $4 million, which was legislated in 2018. And in 2016, 2020 rather, he vetoed that bill, which would have allocated 3.7, 3.6 million more dollars for violence prevention programs in the state. He vetoed that at a time when violence uh, was increasing in Prince George's County and in Baltimore as a result of the COVID epidemic. And so my colleagues and I, through the Maryland uh, Violence Prevention Coalition, uh, we um, testified in Annapolis and we overrode that bill. But even though we overrode uh, Governor Hogan's veto, we're still waiting for him to release the funds to the violence intervention programs in the state. And so I, I implore all of you to call your state senators as well as your federal senators in Maryland um, so we can get that money out to violence intervention programs so they can begin to do the great work they're already doing. And then last, uh, the Dickey Amendment, which was established in 1996, essentially had prohibited gun violence research. So for well over 24 years, uh, we had no support as gun violence researchers from the federal government to understand the causes and collateral consequences of gun violence. And that only recently happened within uh, 2020 that the CDC and the NIH funded gun violence research at the tune of $25 million. But as you can see, among the leading causes of death, gun violence is number 12, but it actually ranks 19th in terms of the amount of funding that's spent on gun violence research. So we need to fund more community-based programs. And I dedicate this presentation and all my presentations. This is Marge Powers who was a member of the Hospital Violence Prevention Program. And after I left and Che left uh, in June of 2019, unfortunately, in June of 2019, unfortunately, in November of November 12th of 2019, he was murdered. And so we dedicate um, all of our presentations and work to him. And I think it's a reflection of what happens when we take our hands off of young black men and we're no longer actively involved in their lives. And because the program essentially lost their director and violence intervention specialist, this was one of the casualties of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richardson, for this important um, complex and uh, multi-layered uh, presentation on gun violence and young men both in DC and Baltimore City. Uh, we are going to use the remaining 20 minutes for Q&A. And uh, we start with our first question, which reads, is it fair to compare DC to other states? DC is far more comparable to other cities in terms of incarceration rate. If you look at per capita incarceration, uh, incarceration, Louisiana is far higher when accounting for population. The question is, should we compare DC? Yes, yes, yes. I don't think we should compare. I mean, we DC is DC is a small city. It's 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 very unique. It's not a state, right? It's never had statehood. So comparing it to other cities, I don't think is necessarily um, what we should be doing. But I, I do think as the nation's capital, DC should be should serve as the leader and pioneer in terms of violence prevention and violence re, and violence reduction. And we need to we need to be in, have DC as the model for our nation. But when we have a city that has experienced significant disinvestment um, in the resources in the district, and we find that gun violence is continuing to increase as we pull back, as I as shown, the, the, the level of uh, funding for the Metropolitan Police Department 
compared to the level of funding for public health interventions, if we're doing that in DC, then that's really not sending a great message to the rest of the country. Okay, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to ask uh, this question. Could you explain more what, what you said about the Dickey Amendment? What is it sure. about and how does that relate to your study? Great question. So the Dickey Amendment was legislation uh, framed by a senator in Arkansas. His name was Jay Dickey. And what the Dickey Amendment essentially said is that um, funding gun violence intervention and prevention initiatives would seem would appear as a form of gun control. And so what the Dick what Jay Dickey was able to convince Congress was is that funding these initiatives with federal dollars would be perceived as a gun control and would infringe on the rights of gun owners. And the NRA got behind the Dickey Amendment with a ton of resources and outreach. And we know the connections, at least at that time, that the NRA had and the power they had in con political power they had in Congress, they were able to pass that legislation, which essentially said that the, the federal government could not use uh, federal dollars to support gun violence research. So that started in 1996 and from 1996 to 2020, if you were a gun violence researcher, you, you were pretty much hard pressed to find federal dollars to support your research, right? And I think that that lack of data has impacted the policies that we have, our violence prevention and intervention initiatives and what we know about gun violence because we're 24 years behind. The rest of in, in the rest of the country in any other area, let's just say sepsis, right? So, um, the Dickey Amendment has had a tremendous impact, and and last year was the first year that the CDC and the NIH funded gun violence research, but the gun violence research was was the the cap was twenty five million dollars, twelve point five million dollars was split between. Uh, the CDC and then another 12.5 for the NIH. And so while gun violence researchers, because we've been starving for years for federal funding, that seemed to be, you know, a, a step forward. I would also say it's a drop in the bucket compared to the way other uh, public health crises are funded. And that, uh, and that is, and I would also add that that limits or affects the, the number of gun violence researchers who decide to jump into the gun violence researcher pipeline as a career. Because if you know that there's no funding to, to uh, support your research as a gun violence researcher, and then maybe I'm just a martyr because I believe in the mission of saving um, the lives of, of young black men, that I jumped into this area with, you know, not thinking about the funding at all, but, you, you know, doing things on a shoestring budget. But if you really are uh, a, a true researcher and know that funding is the route to support rigorous research that can affect, that can impact and transform policy and programming, you know, it would be quite discouraging to be to uh, decide to become a gun violence researcher knowing that for 24 years, the federal government wasn't funding that kind of research. Thank you. Gloria, there are two questions in the chat. Okay, uh, can you ask yes. the first one? Um, the first one is, um, as an aspiring young teacher for the Black community, what can we do to end discrimination and racism of people like us? First, uh, you know, great question, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I don't, I don't think we'll ever end racism. Um, it's baked into the fabric and the institutions of this country, but I do think in our small slices of the world as educators, um, we can we can be truthful about the history of this country. And the reason why I, I emphasize structural violence, um, one of the reasons why is because it's so important that we address um, the erasure of history as a form of violence. Right. One of the things that I did not mention in my presentation um, 
not this most recent health report, but uh, the health report in Baltimore prior to the most recent one that was conducted. What they found is the life expectancy in Sandtown, Winchester, which is one of the poorest neighborhoods in, in Baltimore and where Freddie Gray lived, that the life expectancy in that neighborhood was 62 years of age. Think about that. The life expectancy in Sandtown, Winchester is, was equivalent to the life expectancy in Haiti, which is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. But a lot of people don't understand because of the historical erasure of the history of Haiti. They don't understand how Haiti arrived at a life expectancy of 62.5 years, right? But there's another, an entire other narrative to Haiti that people need to get to make the comparison between Haiti and Sandtown. And I don't want to go too deep into the history of Haiti, but clearly Haiti was the first country in the Western Hemisphere to, to, establish, to have a revolution and establish its own sovereignty, right? There were implications that were attached to that. And many of them were enforced by the United States and France, which France forced Haiti to pay economic reparations for Haiti establishing its independence, which led to economic embargoes, which then those economic embargoes in terms of structural violence led to fewer resources, which then led to a lower life expectancy. And so we have to be able to make, we have to understand what history means. And I, I guess that's the critical junction where we are getting back to the person who asked this question, where all of this discussion is happening around critical race theory, right? The erasure of history in schools because people don't want to accept what the truth is, right? In terms of structural racism. And so what I would advocate for is to, in every class, always illuminate the ways that structural racism has impacted uh, African-Americans and the way that it's in, impacted indigenous people and brown people in this country and those who have been oppressed. That's, we should not shy away from that discussion because there, it's a factual discussion. It happened and I think the only way that we'll be able to remedy the future is we understand the mistakes that we've made in the past and that we're going down a perilous path if we decide to erase history. And I'm saying that as a public health scholar and a social scientist, I also include and make sure that I include history to, so people can understand how we arrived at these health outcomes. There's an entire history there that we need to connect the history to the social sciences. So Courtney, go, go on with the second question. Sure. Okay. Um, let me find it. Okay. Um, this person says, I'm thinking about what I heard you say at the beginning regarding the connection between trauma and quick anger and hypervigilance and the availability of guns. What mm -hmm. do you think about gun laws in the US? Thinking of the case that the Supreme Court is considering now, would it help to reduce the availability of guns or were gun violence rates lower before the 2018 Supreme Court case, Heller, that expanded the availability of guns in DC? So gun violence was increasing um, before that 2018 case. And if you look at any statistics, you'll see that. And then we had peaks of gun violence in the 90s, right? So clearly the accessibility to guns increases the lethality of gun violence with, without question. I mean, there are more guns in America than there are people. There are th on average, there are almost four, 400 million guns in circulation compared to 340 million Americans, right? So we have more guns than any other nation in the, in the world. So I would never argue that, you know, America has a situation uh, with accessibility to guns. But I also think, again, that we have other issues that we need to address in terms of around structural violence, right? So how does, how does someone get to the point where they've experienced so many adverse childhood experiences across their lives because they live in a community that's inundated with trauma, right? How do you address that? That's not something you can just immediately erase with just gun laws. That will take resources and communities to address 
the trauma that's occurred systematically over the course of someone's life to lead them to the point where they become so irritable and hostile that they flip off the handle. And whether they had a gun or they have access to a knife or a hammer, they, we still have to deal with the trauma, right? And, and I think that's what we're missing in the equation is communities that are traumatized that absolutely have no resources to deal with their trauma. We're a traumatized nation. Let me just throw out one statistic. There are, there are 30,000 people for every one mental health clinician in this country. A ratio of one to 30,000. So clearly we have not made an investment in mental health resources that are accessible to, to the people who desperately need them. And so while I am for background checks and eliminating, and limiting the number of guns that are out there, which, you know, as long as we have the second amendment and we have the powers that be in Congress, that's a very uphill battle. But I think some of the more immediate and urgent things that we can do is we need to begin to invest more mental health resources and train more people to go into these communities to provide access to mental health resources. Because what we're finding is it shouldn't take someone to get shot, to come into a hospital that has a hospital violence intervention program, which they're one of, which they're 40 in the world. So you have to be quite lucky to be shot in the city that has one to come into a hospital and then be able to get mental health services, not necessarily for the for your trauma associated for your gunshot wound, but for all the trauma that led up that was prior to you even getting shot. So why do you need to get shot in order to have access to those services that are free? That's the problem. There's another question here. How, if at all, can this research be tailored to persuade federal and state level leaders to restructure their policy making towards centering a public health approach? I imagine, especially because of the focus on individualism within conservative spaces, it can be difficult to showcase the ben uh, benefit of social work and intervention. So I, 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 I the, same, the same person added, especially seeing the hiccups that have been fought from our incumbent governor. So. I think that gets back to this issue around research, right? The problem has been, we don't have enough data to support the effectiveness of many of the programs that are out there right now, because we just have had such limited um, uh, gun violence research that we can't, we don't, we can't conclusively show with many of the programs that how their, their level of effectiveness. Now, clearly there are some which have proven to work in their evidence and form, but I would say that it just in terms of, of research and evaluation, what we have found in many of the grants is research and evaluation in a grant is often an afterthought. And so um, there is an initiative now and a movement for the American Rescue Plan there's a community violence and an initiative that myself and many of my colleagues in the gun violence space are pushing for the legislation for $5 billion to be uh, committed to gun violence intervention and prevention initiatives throughout the country. And that's being proposed now how we plan to, to spend that money. But I would also say even in those discussions, the, the, the amount of money that is dedicated to gun violence research, even within that discussion, has been quite limited. And so what we really need to do is increase the level of research that we have to, to prove what works and what doesn't work. And we won't be able to do that unless we have the funding to go in front of Congress and say, clearly say, conclusively, these are programs that work. And if we were able to commit more federal and state dollars to these programs, we would probably see gun violence be reduced significantly. There are some programs that were showing uh, 
amazing strides before COVID happened and then everything kind of just went left because people weren't able to actually engage with other individuals in the street. And many people who have been doing violence intervention outreach work had to shift over to PPE because they had to, the resources had to be allocated to there. So we were making strides, but we kind of fell a little bit uh, backwards because um, of COVID and all the implications that happened during COVID. And we're still in a point of speculation in terms of why gun violence has increased during COVID. We still, we don't, at, at this very moment, we don't have evidence to, to support any of our theories. They're all speculative, right? Because it's often difficult for researchers to get on the ground. And I just wanna get a shout out to the collective, which is a group of black and brown researchers who actually are able to get on the ground and culturally competent and get the context because you can't make true decisions based on information that you're gathering from 30,000 feet in the air. You have to be proximate to the suffering. You have to be in the trenches. You have to be able to get the voices and the narratives for people who are really affected by it in order to cause change because they have the solutions. And if there's one thing that I would leave everyone with, we really need to rely on those people who are most affected by gun violence to be engaged in the policy and practice and funding discussions about how to solve it. Because they're not in those discussions. And it's up to us to bring them to the table because they have the solutions, because they understand everything that's playing out on the ground for why this is occurring. Yeah, I have um, perhaps what will be the last question uh, since we're talking of um, funding. Um, are there business corporations and non-governmental agencies that stand out in funding gun violence research that deserve a shout out? Uh, so there are some a, there's some uh, funders that have taken an initiative even when the federal government wasn't committed to it. Um, Arnold Ventures, we've written a paper. My colleagues and I have written a paper and a report on um, on gun violence that was supported by Arnold. Um, the Joyce Foundation, which is in Chicago, has done a lot of really great work in supporting gun violence uh, work. I would say the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which has supported my work on gun violence as well. Um, so there, there are organizations, there are foundations out there that are committed and there are also individual individuals, donors who are committed to it too. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, right? Uh, who, who has funded every town is committed to it. Um, so there, there are some individuals out there that in foundations that are committed to it. Um, to the to the efforts to reduce gun violence, and it, we're out at the forefront of it before the the federal decided to hop on. So I would like to you know give them a shout out and salute them. But we need far more foundations and individual donors and the billionaires and millionaires who are out there to understand nuances because it's often you know historically been underfunded, and and at the end of the day. That lack of information is causing lives, right? Which I've shown throughout my presentation is that, you know, for every dollar that you choose not to invest in it, you're also you also have to re realize the implications of creating a Marge Powers, right? Which is why I ended my presentation with him because as you pull back those resources, what ultimately happens for young people is they'll be engaged in things that'll lead to high risk behaviors. And so we always, we need to have those resources to keep hands on every one of these young people that are, that are out there. And then the, the last thing I would say is just in terms of the narrative shifting with black women and that now, you know, that narrative is not being uplifted enough with the number of black women who are being killed by gun violence. And, you know, last year in Baltimore, there were 48 black women who were killed by gun violence and we're seeing record numbers this year. And so, we also need to, as we, we say, say say her name in the Black Lives Matter movement, we also need to say her name in the number of women that are being killed on the streets of American cities, you know, every day, where we're seeing four women that are being killed, Black women are being killed every day, and no one's mentioning a word about it. So, you know, it's important that we also, we also divert 
you know, our attention to that emerging crisis. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Richardson. Um, a round of applause for him. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you all for attending the 43rd uh, Annual Du Bois Lecture. And uh, with that said, um, we bring the lecture to an end. Thank you. Thank you.